Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to OSF's office in Berlin, just off Schandau Markt, and a very warm welcome to all of you who have joined us online. Um, what you don't see, uh, those who are online, is that we are meeting in one of OSF's convening rooms, which looks different today because on the walls we have the beginning of an art exhibition with, frankly, very troubling images, uh, pictures that Ukrainian artists have produced since the beginning of this war. So we will have more of arts and Ukrainian artists later today, but I just want to mention this because some of you who have come to the room may be wondering uh, what this is on the wall. We will speak about the artwork later after this more political discussion, which I am very happy to open with a fantastic panel, which you can see behind me. The panelists will be introduced in a moment. I just want to explain what we are doing because so many organizations feel that uh, in the week where, you know, one year ago, uh, Russia's full scale, scale invasion of Ukraine began, we today want to convene and discuss what Europe's responsibility is in all of this to make Ukrainian victory possible. It is very much the topic that also dominated uh, many of the discussions at the Munich Security Conference and today around Europe, this week around Europe. As OSF, we bring the debate to as many audiences as we can, and so I'm happy that we are broadcasting uh, this conversation uh, to hopefully all of Europe, to Ukraine, and it will be available after this event online as well. Now, um, I guess for us as the Open Society Foundations, the question of winning the war is far more than a military question and the question of how much support can Ukraine get when. This is, of course, an important issue. But for us, winning this war and uh, coming back to what Ukraine, of course, is and should be, and that is a fully functioning democracy with a very, very engaged civil society, this is very much what we keep an eye on all the time, while, of course, the dominant issue is the military conflict and pushing back on Russia's invasion. So with that in mind, I'm very happy to hand over the word to Ina Piduska, who is the Deputy Director of the International Renaissance Foundation uh, from Kiev. Uh, you have been running the work throughout the war. There was never a moment where you stopped your activities. And it is fantastic that you took the time to come here. Uh, along with a few colleagues, I also welcome Sasha Sushko, who is the Director of the uh, Foundation in Kiev. And I'm handing the floor over to you to introduce the panel and to lead us through the discussion. Inna, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniela. It's been a privilege to work together with the OSF and the civil society in Ukraine and across the world, the democratic civil society, on uh, helping Ukraine stay strong, uh, fight for its victory, and eventually prevail. It's almost nine years since Russia first invaded and annexed uh, illegally the Crimea and uh, first invaded in the Donbass. And now, as we are looking into this first year of uh, uh, the full-scale invasion, which shook the world with the images of the blatant human rights violations and the abuse of international law, the injustice and terror and war crimes. And yet Ukraine is standing strong. Uh, Ukrainian people have shown remarkable courage, determination, and resilience. And the international community has shown the unprecedented unity and commitment to support Ukraine as much as it needs and the huge solidarity with the Ukrainian people. For Ukrainians, this victory is the only possible way and it needs to happen as soon as possible with all the support that Ukraine might need. And the solution for this war is the only way how we uh, prevent atrocities, save lives, make sure that the human rights protection is in place, make sure that this destruction is stopped and the cost of recovery is less, and that Russia pays for its war crimes and is brought accountable. Uh, the alternative to Ukraine winning this war and establishing the just and sustainable peace is the imminent danger to the world order as we know it, and which all authoritarians of all shades will feel that they are entitled to do whatever they please and they will have the impunity. This is exactly what 
uh, we need to prevent. This is exactly why we are here today also to talk about what Ukrainian victory means, what it takes to deliver, how we can help, and uh, also share some very practical, very concrete steps that we are taking, you are taking, each and every one of us is doing that. So it's a pivotal moment for democracies and particularly for Europe and everybody is watching. I mean, the whole world is watching how Ukraine will prevail and how United Europe and how the transatlantic community and the democratic international community will help that happen. So what these steps could be, it's my privilege and honor today to be able to ask this question from our distinguished panelists here and let me introduce uh, uh, people who do not need introduction. I'm sure there's so many of people who have met you before, but still, Mr. Amit Nurepur, member of the Bundestag, co-chair of the German Greens, and one of the most prominent voices for supporting Ukraine's victory and uh, uh, calling for the international support in Ukraine's effort to defend itself. Mr. Nico Lange, someone uh, I was so happy to see again uh, because we met many, many years in Ukraine when Nico was working there, and now Nico is the senior fellow with the Saiton Wenger Initiative at the Munich Security Conference, uh, and also one of the strongest voices providing much needed analysis on what Ukraine uh, is doing now, and also the war broader about the analysis about this, world, uh, this war. Mr. Nicholas Tenser, uh, the director of the journal Desk Russi, a non-resident senior fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis and an astute observer of Ukraine and the wider region, not just now with the start of the full-scale invasion, but for all these many years. And thank you so much for bringing in your analysis uh, and also for uh, supporting Ukraine's victory in France and beyond. And last but certainly not least, my dear colleague from Ukraine, uh, Maria Zolkina. Uh, Maria is the head of the regional security studies at a Ukrainian think tank, which is called the Democratic Initiatives Foundation. It's one of the oldest, most prominent Ukrainian think tanks. And Maria is also the research fellow at the London School of Economics, bringing today to this conversation her many years of experience of looking at the occupied territories, looking at the reintegration policies, regional security, wartime diplomacy, and also how the war affects the social and political climate in the country and the public opinion. Welcome. It's really a privilege to have you here. And let me start our conversation with a very important question to which I would ask every speaker to answer in a very brief way. And this is, when we say Ukraine victory, what do we mean? And how do you define Ukraine's victory as we sit here? So, Nicholas, would you like to begin? <laughs> well, thank you very much. Well, the first thing I would have to say is that probably uh, Ukraine victory should have already happened. And that's quite, I think, troubling that we are celebrating today the first anniversary of the war. We in the West, we had the means to defeat Russia on the battlefield. And we didn't. And so, basically, the victory of Ukraine would mean that there will be no second anniversary. What it means concretely? First of all, Ukraine must reconquer its all territories, including Crimea. There is no special status for Crimea. Crimea is Ukraine. Second, there will be a criminal trial for all those guilty of four categories of crime. Crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, crime of genocide, very well documented, and crime of aggression. Thirdly, we must absolutely make everything to have the kids back home. I mean the Ukrainian kids. More than 16,000 children, and probably much more, were deported to Russia. It's a crime of genocide under the conventions of December 8th 9th, sorry, 1948. And then, fourthly, there must be the payment of war damages. 
That's not negotiable. But last but not least, if there is Ukraine's victory without the full defeat of Russia, the war will come again. The war will start again. And Russia must be defeated in Ukraine, but it must be also defeated in Georgia, in Moldova, in Belarus, in Syria. It must step, stop also its meddling into the democratic lives of democracies in Europe, in the US, and elsewhere. It must stop its support to all the dictatorships around the world, namely Myanmar, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela. And I think that we must have this long-term vision. And so victory of Ukraine comes along with the full defeat of Russia. And we must have this long-term vision. There will be absolutely no way back to normalcy or business as usual with Russia as it is now. Thank you. Thank you. That was a big answer to the tremendously important and big question. Thank you so much for that. So, Maria, what is the victory of Ukraine? Can you define it, please? The victory of Ukraine to me is, first of all, reaching sustainable peace in the region. So it, doesn't, it does mean that, first of all, it's full deoccupation of uh, entire Ukrainian territories. And militarily, by the way, it's uh, much more reasonable even from than in comparison to political um, perspective. It's much more reasonable uh, to deoccupy entire Ukrainian region and not to compromise about Crimea, exactly because Crimea is the main military basis of Russia. And Ukraine will never, and, and uh, Black Sea region will never be you know, safe if Crimea will be occupied. Second pillar of Ukrainian victory is bringing Ukraine uh, or formal inclusion of Ukraine into international uh, security system. First of all, NATO. Uh, secondly, which it doesn't contradict NATO membership, specific defense alliances with specific countries, mainly eastern flank of NATO, most probably UK, uh, maybe a different track, bilateral track with US, to make Ukraine defense industry, military industry, uh, army capabilities to be improved. Uh, in together with uh, our partners uh, and cooperation with them. Third pillar is uh, maximum um, exhaustion and destruction of Russian defense and military capabilities, exactly for the reasons described by the previous speaker. And the fourth pillar is, of course, justice. This is one of the most important to bring Russian uh, war criminals to international justice, and this is one of the main tasks uh, to start working on now. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Uh, specifically, thank you for mentioning justice, because the, so far the, the, so many important things about victory were uh, mentioned, and they were about the military victory. But we know that this is, this is beyond just the victory in the battlefield. Thank you so much. So, Mr. Amit Norupur, your uh, definition of Ukraine's victory, please. Uh, I once was, uh, th thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, to, uh, especially to the Open Society for the tremendous work you're doing here. Uh, and especially for the support you're, you're delivering to, to the people of Ukraine for, for, for a long time. Um, the, the core of this conflict is about uh, the sovereignty of, of the Ukrainian people and uh, that they get back their dignity and uh, their sovereignty and their freedom. I once was honored by Sergei Jadan, one of the leading intellectuals of the country, and a die-hard Kharkivian, uh, who, who once gave me a city tour through, through this amazing city. And when we finished, it was so moving to see all of these places of, of history where German, the German uh, armed forces during the World War II committed unbelievable uh, uh, criminal acts. I'm telling that because we have this Russian narrative talking about the Germans committing crime to the Russians, and it's true, but it was not only about the Russians. 500,000 people have been killed by the Germans in Kiev, 200,000 people and during the battle on Kharkiv and so on and so on. And so if there is a German historical duty, it's not to, to, to Russia alone, it's to all of the countries we, we brought all of the suffer to. Uh, and when we finished that, did this moving tour, I asked him what his core wishes to, to the Germans and then to the, to the Europeans and then to the, to the West. And his answer was, treat us as a subject. So this is the core of the conflict. This is what cr the Kremlin is denying, to treating Ukraine as a subject. So the answer to your question is, this is not about me to define it. It's about the Ukrainian people. And at the end of the day, 
hope, hopefully as soon as it's possible, there's going to be a negotiation table. And there is just one option, and this is that the Ukrainian people are in the driver's seat and we support them in these negotiations. And they, they're going to define what, what the, 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 the conditions for, for negotiations are. They're going to define what, 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 what victory means. And during this period of time, it's our job to, to support them to get to that point that they can say it's going to be a victory. Yeah, thank you so much. Specifically, thank you for mentioning the Ukrainian people really decide their destiny. And this is what they are fighting for, for the freedom to decide their destiny as a European democracy, as an open society, and they are in the driving seat. Thank you so much for mentioning this. So, Nico Lange, your touch on and your definition of what Ukrainian victory means to you. I think what we all have learned and what is still difficult to learn, especially for politicians in Germany, but also in other places, is that our Political discussions are shaped by the military reality on the battlefield in Ukraine. So we can have whatever political discussion we want. In the end, our thinking is dependent on how the developments on the front line are. And there, I would say, in a strictly military sense, we are two out of four. 50% of Ukrainian victory is already there. First, Ukraine has denied the military plans of a quick victory by Russia, by total defense of all Ukrainian society. It's not only the Russian armed forces confronted with the Ukrainian armed forces, it's the Russian armed forces confronted with all of Ukrainian society. And second, Ukraine has already taken back 50% of the territory that was occupied by Russia. And strictly military speaking, I think step three should now be U Ukraine in a combined arms maneuver, integrating the infantry fighting vehicles and the main battle tanks that came, they came late, but they came, to break through the front line that is there now, to open up the space for step four, and step four is sweeping the Russian forces out of Ukraine's territory, bringing Ukraine back to its internationally recognized border from 1991. And militarily, I think step one and two have been achieved by the Ukrainians with our support, and I think step three and step four are achievable. Thank you. Thank you so much for these really great and rich definitions of uh, Ukraine victory. Quite, quite, a, quite, quite a lot of them, and we will come back to them. Uh, I have a number of questions for all of you, but I also would like to ask uh, all the participants to think about your own questions, uh, because we will be coming uh, to them right now also, just to announce there's uh, there's a booklet over there for you. The OSF has prepared recommendations about uh, how to turn the tide in the Russian war against Ukraine, what needs to be done and needs to be done fast. So please take a look after our conversation here. And uh, uh, well, now we are coming back to the questions and let me turn first to Mr. Omid Nuripur with the question specifically for you, which is considering that Germany has finally committed to the delivery of Leopard tanks, freed Leopards. How do you assess Ukraine's current prospects for and what for the support is needed and uh, what can be realistically expected? Please. Uh, I think, uh, let me come back to that, what I said before. There are a couple of steps. The first one is to, to let the Ukrainian people elaborate what they need and what the necessities are. And I fully agree that we have to go on in the military debate, but I think it's also necessary to talk about the other, other, uh, the other uh, branches. Uh, obviously, the Russian air, fo air forces, including the, this, this bloody Iranian drones, are targeting systematically the electricity system of, of Ukraine. This is why it's not only about military support, it's about bringing quick fixes for, for energy system of, of Ukraine also immediately and as, as much as we can. Second one, of course, is the question of what we can, and we have to be transparent on that, transparent on that, and, and be clear on that. The Ukrainian people ask us, give us this or that, and we have not it. We have to, we have to admit, and we say it quickly, and it, it, it's part of being reliable to be clear on that, and not just just hoaxing in, in this, at that direction. And the, the, the third one is, of course, the question of, of coming together as, as, as partners and then talk about it and, 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 and find a way if we are not able to support, if there are other countries who can and who could do more or, or what, the, what could, kind of role, which is, is, is uh, definitely the right one for, for, other, uh, uh, for, for other countries to, to play that. Beside of that, it's super important to, um, to watch and to try to, to show leadership in our domestic debate. 
Um, I, I was in Kiev two weeks ago. Uh, I, got, I got a gift here. This is a, a rustle, rustle band uh, uh, of, of a piece of steel uh, from the last delivery of, of, of steel from, from Azovstal. Uh, and this is so emotional, not only for, 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 for Ukrainian people, but also to me to see that, uh, knowing that what happened to, to Azovstal and how many people died there. And I think it's super important first to understand that if there is a fatigue, this is uh, in, within Ukraine because they, they, are, they are under attack for nine years now. Second, beside of that, of course, there, is, there are people exhausted in Ukraine. Besides of that, I didn't see anybody there who did not talk about the plans after the war and after the victory. Everybody's saying, okay, I'm now exhausted, I'm, 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 I'm tired, but we're going to win, and after that, we're going to do this. This is, inspiring. this is an inspiring courage. We have, we have to, to, to get that, we have to receive this inspiration. Third, it's so important to talk about places like Mariupol. If there is one place on Earth without any peace, these are the occupied territories. There is no peace where, where the Russian armed forces are. And this is the, this is the misleading uh, fact of, of, of the voices in our countries who are saying, well, let's talk and negotiate and then freeze the front line and the green line or whatever, the contact line, and, and then there's going to be peace. There is no peace if Russia can succeed. The, the, you, you mentioned the, 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 the reasons for that also. But the, the life of the people of Ukraine in Mariupol, as half of the city has physically gone. It's, it's so important to, 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 to be said within our, our societies and within our domestic issues to conserve the solidarity of our people, which is huge. And we should not underestimate that. And uh, the, the last one is we have to trust our own people, and we have to argue in a clear way. To be honest, if there is some kind of a fatigue in Germany, this is not coming from the society to the politics, coming from politics to society. And this is because of people who have definitely no vision how to go into a discussion and then, and, and then just tell the people how the situation is. And the situation is, the Ukrainian people have gained half of their territories back, and the Ukrainian people can win this war, and the Ukrainian people are fighting not only for themselves, but for peace in Europe, and, and for our security system, and for the entire security ar architecture of Europe, we know for, for the last decades. We are benefiting for, for, from the losses of the Ukrainian people. We should say that also. And, and, and not just, just being hesitating to, to talk about, well, I have no idea how many, um, how they, uh, uh, how the Germans can stand home and how long they can, they can do that or that. Or. This is not the issue. The issue is how can we come to an end by supporting the Ukrainian people? Thank you. Thank you so much for this really important point. Uh, also speaking about uh, the need to do whatever it takes to prevent the fatigue and uh, really maintain the spirit of solidarity and the really very active solidarity and practice and also particularly appreciate the mention of there's no peace in the occupied territories and this is why Ukraine really needs to, need to win this war because that's the only, as I was saying, that's the only way to uh, stop the repression and the murder and rape of, uh, uh, of people who are in the occupied territories. Ukraine just cannot abandon them over there. But let us follow on this point and turn now to Nico. And uh, uh, while well, you started answering this question, actually, and some of the what I thought would be asking you, and uh, when you were defining. Uh, Ukraine's victory, but how realistic you think now with the steps one and two already done, three and four that you defined, uh, for Ukraine to regain its uh, uh, borders, its, its territory, and what needs to be done for that? Uh, like, could you be a little bit more specific what you think on uh, like the next steps and the very practical steps, especially those Germany can help? I think the most important thing to understand, especially in the German debate, because the Ukrainians know this well, is that the endless strength of the Russian armed forces or the unbeatable Russian armed forces, this is a myth. Russia can be beaten. Russia has been already defeated in this war. No military goals have been achieved by Russia. And I mean, from a Russian point of view, looking into the speeches that were given yesterday, it's very difficult to understand how could a good end of this look from a Russian point of view? 
losing a few 10,000 more soldiers to occupy a few kilometers more of territory. Um, it's, I think, uh, uh, something the Ukrainians have understood well, but is in the debates you mentioned, it's still this mythological figure that nothing can be done because Russia is uh, so strong. What we see is, on the ground, the so-called spring offensive by Russia is not a comprehensive big offensive. It's a series of local attacks along the front line where we see a mix of First World War, Second World War and the War of the Future happening at the same time. But it's a primitive storm of infantry against relatively well-fortified Ukrainian positions. There's not much to achieve there from a Russian point of view. And there is no, I'm still elaborating on the myth, there is no second Russian army that will appear from somewhere and threaten us or turn things around. I think what needs to be done now is supply Ukraine with ammunition, and this includes the increase of production of ammunition. I think this is a key issue now in the war. Ukraine is still consuming more artillery ammunition per month than Europe and the US together are producing. And increasing the production for artillery ammunition is also the right signal to Putin. He cannot outproduce us. It would be ridiculous if Putin could outproduce us as the most rich and industrialized countries in the world on something simple such as artillery ammunition. So I think artillery ammunition is now key. And in addition to that, I think Ukraine needs a little bit of time. And for, for me, from the analysis, I see the race against time is now turning in favor of Ukraine because the front lines are holding. Ukraine, for now, did not have to commit reserves to the front line. That means the reserves can be kept, they can be trained, they can integrate the new equipment that is coming, they can train combined arms maneuvers and then break through the front line. I think that is the next decisive stand, preferably in the south to the Azov Sea, because that will make the situation for the Russian armed forces and for Crimea extremely difficult, and it will have uh, an opening up effect to the rest uh, of the occupied territories and will give uh, Ukraine a chance to take them back. On the specific needs, from a military point of view, I just want to mention there are always two measurements. And if you take the one measurement from the German political debate, did Germany do much? Everybody would say, yes, Germany did a lot. But if you take the other me measurement, what is militarily not tell the soldier in Bakhmut, well, you have to understand, Germany moved very far. He either has what he needs or he doesn't have it. Ammunition, drones, drone defense uh, equipment, defense against the brutal converted S-300 missiles that are driven into Ukrainian cities on the front line every day and night. That is what is necessary now. And most of all, that's my last point, especially in Germany, not this incremental approach where we always react too late already. Looking forward into this war, what do we want to achieve or what do we want Ukraine to achieve? And if we want Ukraine to clean the territories from Russian armed forces, then we are also talking airplanes to support the troops on the ground. Not necessarily German ones, but multi-role fighters such as the F-16 would be a good instrument for that. A forward-looking approach that I think would, would really help and it would be better to look forward into the second year than look, looking back into the first yeah, year. We, we heard from Nicholas that the best would be not to have the second year and definitely not to have the second university. I mean, but, uh, if we understand that we can own the timeline, we do not have to wait for Russia to do the next steps. If we, the partners of Ukraine, together decide what we want to deliver to Ukraine to shorten the timeline, then Ukraine will be able to win faster. Yeah, and we will talk about uh, that, that as well, what needs to deliver, be delivered, not just in the military terms, because for Ukraine it's also important to look at the victory in the whole holistic way, and also not just to win the war, but also, as we say, to win the peace. I hope we will be able to talk more about that, but let me now turn to Maria and uh, ask a question. Uh, so there's a mis misperception, misconception that the war is just one year on, and I know that you think differently. Can you explain why and why it's important to take this wider look at what has been done by Russia on the territory of Ukraine since 2014 and probably even earlier than that? 
Thank you for this question, because really when Ru Russia in invaded Ukraine for the second time on a large scope in February 2022, we Ukrainian experts found out that we have to explain to the entire world that this is just another stage of Russian war against Ukraine, which started actually in 2014. And Russia, unfortunately, was pretty successful in creating uh, in different regions around the world the myth of so-called separatists in Donbas, of some kind of uh, self-determination of Crimea, uh, and we have to debunk all these myths up to now. Uh, Ukrainian society had no uh, doubts that the war in Donbas and occupation of Crimea is Russian aggression against Ukraine. And on the eve of the large-scale invasion of Russia last year, according to public opinion polls, like more than 70% of Ukrainians were certain about that and gave that definition of the conflict actually. Not civil war, not any kind of competing of global powers on the territories of Ukraine, but Russian aggression against Ukraine. And as of now, the situation is even more clear. But um, what happened during previous years, the war in Donbas and occupation of Crimea is actually has actually led Ukrainian society to uh, pre to being pr pretty clear about how to deal further. Ukrainians are certain that Russia will be defeated in this war and that political compromises at the cost of Ukrainian territorial integrity are not acceptable exactly because we have experience of previous eight years of the war. Thank you, Maria. So, Nicholas, let's look at uh, this war again in perspective, not as something which is happening for one year, but uh, from a like, longer term, and you've been observing it for so many years. But I would like to ask you about the uh, French perspective on the war. And uh, it seems that France has been traditionally preoccupied with the idea of not to humiliate Russia like outright. And that's well, I don't know if you think if that works, but uh, why do you think uh, it's actually in France's, as well as with all Europe's interests, that Ukraine wins this war? Yes, absolutely. I think that's uh, basically Europe's interest and that the world's interest. And I think that basically there will be, uh, the world will be a better place uh, without Putin's Russia, as we all know. And uh, I think we, we have to state it very clearly. I mean, us, our ambition, or goal and perspective. Uh, from a French perspective, I must say that there was a lot, there were a lot of very lonely voices in France in so more than 10 years, including me, uh, trying just to, to well, to, to raise awareness uh, about the very nature of Putin's regime, about the fact that it was a criminal regime, uh, saying to the, the president certainly not to shake hand with Mr. Putin, because basically we, 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 we haven't shook hand with uh, al-Baghdadi or uh, with, uh, with Osama bin Laden. Uh, and the very difference between Mr. Putin and those uh, two uh, Islamist terrorists uh, are basically that Putin most of the time is wearing a, car, a, 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 a tie, that he has nukes, and that actually he had killed more than ISIS and Al-Qaeda combined. Uh, and I think that we have basically to face the crimes that Putin has committed the, since 23 years. And in fact, talking about the French debate, quite no one was talking about those crimes. And I remember also some, uh, uh, an editor of a journal uh, in uh, 2016, in one of my pieces, I depicted to Mr. Putin as an enemy. And he told me, even if he, was, he agreed with me, no, you cannot use this word. <coughs> and that was basically the state of the, of the French debate. Uh, and I remember President Macron, uh, he was not president at that time, he was the Minister of Economy, it was in 2016. He met his counterpart in Moscow, um, the Minister of Economy uh, of uh, Russian Federation, and then he said, well, we have certainly progressively to lift the sanctions. And I remember that, uh, well, I, I said to him, well, wh what did you say? It's just, we, we cannot envision, and I think it was completely, basically, most of the French leader, the political class, have turned a blind eye to the crimes committed by Russia. They didn't perceive Mr. Putin uh, as basically a kind of uh, totorina uh, with nukes, uh, which was uh, the fact. 
Then there was a slow evolution of, uh, of course, the French position, especially since uh, February 24th. Uh, Macron, even if he didn't acknowledge, I mean, uh, his uh, mistakes, uh, turned to uh, a more, uh, I will say, substantive speech. And lastly, you know, in a Munich conference, he stated uh, very clearly that uh, uh, Russia must lose the war, that Ukraine must win. But, you know, also, because we have, you know, there was a phrase that Macron was uh, basically coining during his campaign in 2017, which is en même temps, uh, at the same time, simultaneously. Uh, and at the same time, he said, when he came back from Munich, you, you probably saw the interview, uh, because it was translated in uh, other languages, uh, saying we had don't have to crush Russia. But no one wanted to crush Russia. Uh, I mean, uh, Moscow 20, 20, uh, 2023 is not like Berlin in 1945, basically. No one, uh, even if I sometimes consider hawkish, uh, I never suggested to send the troops to Moscow, and no one does. Uh, so he said, basically, no, well, certainly we know that there will be, at the end of the day, uh, some peace talks, uh, some compromises. Uh, even if, of course, uh, Ukraine must win. So sometimes there is a kind of cognitive dissonance in my view. Uh, but he's not the only one. And I will just finish like, with this. When you have some leaders of the free world, uh, not only Macron, stating, well, we will support Ukraine as long as it needs it, and whatever it takes. I am not comfortable with this stance. I am comfortable, yes, the support is good. But at the same time, it's like we are external to the war. Like it's not all war. And I remember in the TV, many TV show on February 24th, I said, it's all war. We are at war. And we cannot consider the battlefield as something which is not ours. Uh, and basically, the results and the victory of Ukraine on the battlefield will depend on what we will do. And when I said that we have to finish the war, it means that we have to provide Ukraine with all the weapons it needs. Fly, fly, uh, fighter jets, more tanks, and long-range missiles. That's all. That's it. And ensure the there is no impunity for uh, the perpetrators. Absolutely, the before. Absolutely. 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 And the war crimes. I mean, thank, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, thank the, you. The criminal law is not a subject of mediation. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this point. So uh, we now open the floor for questions. Please identify yourselves. Please, if possible, choose questions over comments. Keep them within one minute, if possible. Address them to. Uh, any or all of the panelists, uh, there, and uh, uh, there's a mic in the room. You don't need to stand up, I think, yeah, but uh, yes, uh, your questions, please. So, I, uh, for, so the first uh, hand over there, Mr. Ralph Fuchs, uh, Rina, Alexander, so just identi please identify yeah. yourself. <laughs> Ralph Fuchs from the Center for Liberal Modernity, and I was provoked by Nicholas. Uh, to jump in and to continue a little bit your um, analysis and, and, and your thoughts. Um, I've also been in, in Munich, and if you listen to all these uh, declarations of Western leaders, of course, on the surface, you had very strong unity, solidarity, support for, for Ukraine. But um, with a second uh, thought, you could see that there was no unity in terms of the strategic goals of the West regarding this war. And you had an ongoing, um, I would say, unspoken uh, uh, or, 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 or hidden difference uh, between those, especially, uh, of course, the Ukrainians and uh, the people from Central Eastern Europe who said, we have to go full in for Ukraine victory, as you did on the panel. And those who said, we have to support the uh, Ukraine uh, so strong and as long as it takes to bring Russia and to bring Putin to the point when he understands that he cannot win this war 
by military means and that he has to agree to negotiations. And then it's up to Ukraine to decide which compromise Ukraine is willing uh, to accept. And these are two to uh, totally different than concepts. And if you think about why, especially Western uh, European leaders, but partly also the US administration, why are they so hesitant in terms of going full in for, for enabling Ukraine to win this war? You, have, you, have, you, hear, you are hearing three arguments. The first one you already discussed, Ukraine cannot win finally. This Excuse me, can we have the Russia question? Sorry for resources. interrupt you. The yeah. second the yeah. question. It's, al it's already discussed. The second one is fear of escalation. Fear of escalation of the Ukrainian war and spill over into a, a, a full-fledged confrontation between Russia and NATO with its nuclear uh, uh, risks. And the third one is fear of collapse of Russia. Fear of collapse of the Russia regime. So not promoting regime change, being afraid of regime change. So I would be interested in your answer to the last two arguments. Which is fear of escalation and fear of collapse. Just 10 yeah. seconds. Yeah. I just want to, to, to call to all of you discussing is fine, but tomorrow we have the chance to demonstrate and join the streets for a pro-Ukrainian solidarity demonstration that starts at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and ends with a big final rally at 6 o'clock at the Grand Thank you. Please join us. Yeah, thank you so much. So, uh, who would like to, like, very quick answer to these two comments? So, the second and third. Yep, just in really, like, very few seconds. Uh, who, who would like to start? Yep. You have to decide. Okay. So. Okay. I, I can start. You first, do. First of all, I fully agree with with Ralph on everything. There are three words that we must refrain using: escalations, co belligerence and red lines. The second remark is that we are still, let's speak bluntly, we are still remaining halfway in all support to Ukraine. Thank you. Sure. The, the, um, the problem with the lack of uh, vision of what to do with Russia. But uh, from here, from this point of view, Russia really might be collapsing as a result of military defeat. And this is the scenario which not necessarily should be discussed openly, but definitely should be discussed behind the closed doors between decision makers. And I really do hope that this year it will start. And the level of support to Ukraine, I, I used to measure by uh, the number and the quantity of weapons which are sent to Ukraine exactly because 2023 is a decisive moment. Russian regular army has never been so weak in terms of its capabilities as it is now. And Ukrainian army, despite of all the losses, has never been since the beginning of large-scale invasion so strongly, you know, uh, empowered by, by, by those capacities and capabilities we, we have now. So if it is the moment to, to defeat Russia, this is now. If, it, we will not if we won't receive enough um, weapons uh, to organize large-scale counteroffensive, then we are facing the problem of really protracted conflict for, for years ahead. Thank you. Thank you for this view. Uh, so, Mr. Nuru, I take the escalation one. Answer. Um, everybody, sh uh, there are good reasons to be concerned of, of, of the Russian nukes, absolutely. But first, uh, being co concerned, and because of that, hesitating to do the right thing, means that there is, this should, there is a mechanism, that there is no mechanism. Kremlin does not need any excuses to escalate uh, on, on, on a nuclear, nor on a, on a, um, on a non-nuclear level. Second, we have to understand that the entire regime is based on fear, internally and internationally. If we are just shock frozen because of fear, they're gonna win, and we cannot afford it. So, and Nico, your answer yeah. to maybe, second or two. Maybe just very, a sober on the nuclear threat from a military point of view. I think strategic nuclear use by Russia, regardless of what the propagandists are telling in TV, with their obsession to new Paris, uh, Paris and London and other cities every day, is excluded. Deterrence works. And when it comes to the gap that we all had, uh, when it comes to tactical nuclear weapons, it seems to me that the nuclear rhetorics went down over the last months because there have been conversations 
that made the possible consequences crystal clear to the Russian leadership, so deterrence also works there. What is left is the psychological warfare aspect that is connected to the nuclear threat, but uh, uh, I would not, uh, uh, from a military point of view, I would not uh, take this into consideration anymore. On escalation, I would say, we should turn this totally around. Every Russian missile flying into a civilian city in Ukraine should have an escalation from us on further deliveries. There must be a price for that paid. We should not always wait for Russia to do anything. We should make clear what is unacceptable. And I mean, war crimes committed by bombing civilian cities that must have a reaction from our side. I think that will be a chance to turn this logic around. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I really would like some questions now because we've been discussing uh, the military aspects a lot. And uh, maybe there are some questions which are or like outside or beyond the military escalation questions. So I do have several of them. I saw Irina's hand over there first, then Alexandra's hand, then uh, hand over there, hand over there and over there. So please keep your questions brief. Thank you. I'm Marina Zolonenko, also from Center for Liberal Modernity. Actually, I also wanted to raise two issues which are now discussed partially. Uh, the regime change in Russia, because uh, knowing the uh, long history of Ukraine-Russia's relations, I think Ukraine will never have peace uh, before Russia will change. And uh, you mentioned the crimes of Putin, but there were crimes of the Soviet times, which, never, which Russia never recognized, and this is a problem. Um, and uh, also the second issue I want to raise was nuclear, um, th uh, nuclear threats by Russia. Uh, I think uh, the West hasn't really developed yet an adequate response to that because uh, basically we see that Russia is using uh, nuclear threats to um, compensate for um, conventional sorry, war. sorry, question, Irina, question. Well, I don't have, okay, so I had a question <laughs> on these two issues, but they were kind of addressed, so. Thank you. So that's, that, that's, that, that's, is that the comment? So I think that we should take it to the comment. Alexandria, your question over there. And please address it to one of the speakers. We yeah. cannot just go with like full, full answers if possible. For, first of all, for, for, for your insight. I, I see that probably you also observe in the narratives from, from the Russian side. And we may conclude that Putin is still believing that time is on his side in the longer term. He still prevails that he can he still believes that he can prevail longer because he is ready for a longer confrontation than Ukraine and the West. Ukraine because it's smaller resources, again the West because it's more dependent on, on the voters of their, of, of the, their attitudes. So there are many arguments why hypothetically Putin uh, may have the time on his side. What could you deliver on, on this presumption, or the, this hypothesis, um, if you can? Thank you. So, a very quick answer to the question why Putin thinks time is on his side, and what to do with that. What to do with that? Any ideas? Uh, okay, so, Maria, go ahead. Mr. I really believe that Putin uh, and, and, and facts are proving that Putin is considering that a couple more years uh, for the war of attrition will be uh, actually his factual victory in this war. And the, the, the speech he delivered uh, the day before yesterday or the ye yesterday, uh, this speech was exactly about mobilizing Russian society economy for longer term period. Why he believes? Exactly because he sees that Ukraine is, accept, is receiving military and other types of support in limited restricted quantities. And exactly he believes that the strategy of uh, some of the Western states might be to make Ukraine defend itself rather than organize full-fledged counter-offensive. And until he receives a very clear signal by uh, sending enough uh, uh, types, enough uh, sorry, number of battle tanks. At least he, we have a decision about the supply of the fighter jets to Ukraine. There will be no change in, Ru in Russia. Will drag time and ex expect uh, elections to the European Parliament, elections of a U.S. president and uh, heating of domestic discussions in all European states plus U.S whether Western support is, should be continued. So that's why 2023 is extremely important to start counteroffensive and to make Ukraine do that. We'll come to what needs to happen in 2023, uh, but uh, if there are very quick additional answers to what Maria said, any other options? 
why? Yes. There is a systemic failure of Kremlin for the last nine years is underestimating the Ukrainian people and their stamina. And second, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, underestimating unity of European Union and the resilience of our societies. Yeah, there are all of these issues and there, we have all of the distraction and we have crises beyond of the war also. But in the end of the day, we delivered and we're going to go on delivering. So if there is a waiting gain, and obviously there is one, um, no way that he can win this. Thank you. So, Nicholas, you Basically, uh, two, two things. First of, all, uh, first of all, I must say that he still continues to think that he will be able, as he was in the past, basically to set the agenda. Basically, he set the agenda and he won all his wars during the 22 past years. And he is still in this belief. Second thing is that he considers that he has, of course, he can sacrifice hundreds of thousands or one million of lives without any consequence. And he considers that at the end of the day, if Ukraine has regained part of its territory, there will be, I mean, a kind of consensus among the Western leaders to say, OK, no, we will go to the negotiation table. And it, we have to belie, I mean, this belief. But that's, I mean, in all side. Thank you. So, uh, Nico, if you have the quick answer to the question, or do you want to pass an addition? No, I, I just, I just <laughs> don't like this approach that on each and every step we think about how does Putin feel, what does it do to Russia, and so on and so forth. I mean, let's, let's focus on Ukraine, and let's focus we will on be Ukraine. fine. This is indeed a really great answer. So the question over there, yep. Yes, uh, Barbara Freitag from Prague Civil Society Center, and I would really like to take up what Mr. Unipur said, is that we have consistently underestimated uh, Ukrainian society. I think this war is... Uh, really not only about a military uh, defense, it is uh, the incredible example of civil society spreading to the whole of society. It is for all those like us who deal with civil society, an incredible experience that an entire society is turning civic and activist. And my question is whether this wonderful paper should not include also a targeted, smart, intelligent support really for what uh, Ukrainian uh, civil society needs, uh, people are burned out and at the brink of their energies, but they still know best what is needed in the country, and I think it should be part of our approach. Uh, and at the same time as uh, we have Mr. Tensa here too from Paris, should not the civic, so-called civic society platforms that are still sort of moribund but haven't been dissolved properly, like the Petersburg Dialogue and the uh, uh, Trianon uh, Dialogue, which is no better than what we had here, should they not be dissolved and we should build a proper platform now to listen to Ukrainian society and find out what they need and how we can respond to these needs. So who would like to take this question? Should the new platform be built uh, in which we can listen more to the Ukrainian civil society and actually sure. civil society which yeah. stands for values and uh, democracy. For raising this issue because uh, Ukrainian NGOs and uh, informal groups, uh, uh, actually all the society is uh, horizontally consolidated now and uh, this is a challenge to people to work, uh, you know, non-stop basis. Thank you for raising this issue. The first, uh, the first attempt, the, f the first step I would say is to support already existing organizations and uh, groups uh, as much as possible financially. I, I would say frankly that some of uh, really brilliant Ukrainian and NGOs and even think tanks have to uh, refuse from cooperation with international donors last year exactly because there was not enough support. I mean, there was lots of uh, fi fi financial support for activities, but almost nothing for, let's say, for salaries of uh, people doing that, uh, which is very important, I mean, so we have to support people working on the ground. Second is to create as um, some specific platforms and specific issues like uh, for um, uh, researching uh, 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 d um, 
getting together the data on war crimes because Ukrainian civil society is doing that, but we need international horizontal links to make this information, let's say, legitimized by organizations uh, who can advocate for, for this uh, abroad as well, it's to make the, you know, the backup for future international uh, criminal prosecution of uh, Russia, uh, Russian people for, the, um, for these war crimes. And of course, I um, com completely agree that uh, some, uh, and, and, and third, my recommendation will be, um, I would dare to say this is on behalf of a uh, majority of Ukrainian NGOs and think tanks, S please stop thinking about uh, setting any uh, Russian-Ukrainian dialogues formats. Thank you. So the question over there, uh, yeah, can we, can we have the mic over there, please? Yep. And then, and then over there, Maria. Then, then yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, my name is Maria Golubeva. I'm from uh, the Bosch uh, Academy just around the corner. Um, but uh, former minister from Latvia. Uh, so um, my question is about the, basically the same thing as the previous speaker, but with a slightly different twist. I mean, on the military side, we know that basically there are only two limits to more help to Ukraine. One is political will. Sometimes it's there, sometimes a little bit less there. But there is also the actual logistical capacity issue. You know, how many tanks there are, how many uh, munition items Europe can produce on, you know, are we sending just medley boxes of different kinds of munitions and different kinds of weapons, and does it help because they're not interoperable? So things like that. There are actual limits. But um, otherwise, it's clear what to do. Uh, but in terms of um, Ukraine's uh, potential accession to the European Union, Ukraine's newly gained candidate status, and the seven conditions and the reforms that are linked to this. In terms of reconstruction, and reconstruction starts with a good design, of how we reconstruct, um, there seems to be um, there seem to be other limits to progress there. And my question to you is: Do you think these limits are more on the side of the EU not seeing the opportunities of how it can, for example, boost the potential of public administration in Ukraine, uh, going up to a donors fund that would sponsor the uh, the capacity, including the salaries? There have been some precedents in the past, but not such large scale ones. Or, for example, creating a mechanism for civil society experts to be on a regular basis integrated into all reform plans and monitoring. There are no such structures. There are only ad hoc situations. So where do you think, where, who has the ball? Is it the EU that should do those things, propose those things? Or is it the Ukrainian government and Ukrainian society itself that should come up and say, this is what we need to happen? Thank you. This is just a cluster of questions I really was hoping we will be having here in this, in this room. So, who would like to take the questions? Yeah. Maybe a brief remark. I, I, I even don't know if it's an answer to the question, but it's uh, along the lines of recovery. I believe it's not the European Union. I think it's good that the G7 now has a governance structure for recovery in Ukraine. The question very much is how to intertwine the recovery process that is organized by, these, by this G7 structure with the EU accession process. And it would be good if there would a political goal be formulated that the goal of Ukrainian recovery is the membership of Ukraine in the, mem in the European Union. So those two efforts could be working together. I think what we need for that as a precondition is security guarantees for Ukraine. Because it is unlikely that we can finance Ukraine recovery with taxpayer money. There, need to, there needs to be private investment, and private investment will only come if security is guaranteed. So in the end, I think first things first, winning the war and providing security guarantees is the precondition for any further development. And so far, there are just two ideas on the table. One is the membership of Ukraine and NATO. That's the only security guarantee that we all know that works. And the second, the Kiev Security Compact, basically means arming Ukraine to the teeth so it can deter the Western military district of Russia. Um, Just as I was hoping that you will be talking about the EU accession for Ukraine, and we hopefully will come back to it. But Omid, what would you respond to this question? The, the ball, I would say there are two balls, and, and both of them have to be thrown. And at the end of the day, I'm, I'm super sure that this, the civil society of Ukraine uh, won't let us just keep the ball and, 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 and rest. Uh, just, just coming back to the question we, we had before, um, 
I, I saw, of course, a lot of people I know for, for years working on, on, on NGOs and especially on corruption. And the most, uh, pro the most imp impressing uh, answer I get was, I asked them, I know you for years working on fighting corruption. What are you doing for the last 12 months? Fighting corruption and the Russian army. And these people won't let just the administration of and, and or the EU just just resting and and, and not uh, coming to a to substantial changes on and, and, and the boost you just mentioned on the administration and governance and governance and all of Ukraine. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, any more questions to this very direct? When I was in Ukraine last year, uh, all the persons I met the parliamentary, ministers, mayors, civil societies. They were, of course, asking for more weapons. They were also, of course, showing the evidence of the slaughters. But they were mostly talking about the future. And I think they have, my Ukrainian friends, they have the sense of the future. And they already are just depicting what Ukraine should look like concretely, practically, also from an institutional point of view. So they have the ideas, and we have to support this idea. And this idea coming from the civil society must be ours. Yeah, thank you. So Maria, they, like, if you have a very quick answer, or we pass and move to another question. Sir, is that uh, Ukrainian civil society sees their candidate status as the real story of uh, combining reforms on the one hand and making Ukraine, uh, you know, as close as possible to the membership in the EU. And here I would say that um, as much as possible is being done, at least Ukrainian civil society is pushing Ukrainian authorities, regardless of the war, to adopt uh, decisions, to make reforms, to uh, pass the legislation through the parliament. Uh, and we, I would say just about risk which we have um, uh, in mind, that at some point uh, the European Union countries might think that the candidacy is not just the direct pass towards membership for 100%. For and this is the main risk, I would say. From this perspective, uh, I would say that the ball is on the side of the EU to make it clear that the homework of Ukraine is assessed, you know, properly. Uh, and that uh, this is the common task to make reforms uh, in order to make Ukraine a member of the European Union rather than learn term candidate. I really would like to ask like 10 second answer from each of our uh, German and French participants. And this is, do you think it's realistic to open the accession negotiations this year? And if so, why? One reason. Realistic, not realistic, and why? Yeah, it is. It depends on the, 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 the two balls you were just talking about. You. Yes. Any other? Yes, definitely, because I think Ukraine in the years to come will be probably the model for Europe. Realistic? <laughs> well, I think, I think the peculiarity of the EU accession process is that certain procedures have to be followed. And I would advise Ukraine to, I mean, even if this sounds a little boring, I would excite, advise Ukraine to follow the procedures as they are and not to demand something different from the European Union because that will be impossible to fulfill. Thank you. I think Ukraine is extremely conscious of the need to complete the reforms and move forward on that track. There's a hand over there. Sorry. Yep, Maria. Maria, yep. Maria Haliti, Isar Yednanya. I have a comment uh, actually about EU integration or accession. I do believe that um, European security depends on uh, Ukraine security, on uh, Western Balkan security, and Moldova security. And therefore, I think Europe uh, shall um, speed up the process of integration of Ukraine, Moldova, and Western Balkans to the EU. Another uh, issue, uh, you actually raised a question about uh, when, uh, what will, would be the victory. And my question actually to the panelists, uh, whether liberation of all our territories would be the victory, or we shall already start to think what to do with Russia. Uh, of course, Maria mentioned that uh, weak military Russia would be, um, would be a part of this, uh, of this security. But also NATO membership, but EU and for the West, it is important to start to develop strategy towards Russia. 
It is important to think what happened if Russia, for example, dissolute. It's important to think what to do with China. And my question, why it's so difficult to start to think about the strategy? And if uh, to start about the strategy, what the strategy should be? Thank you. Well, that's a question for another very big conference. But still, if we, the, we can answer the question, why is it so difficult to stop thinking strategically about Russia? What's your version? Well, I think, I think uh, what I said before, uh, we should not make it all about Russia. It's about uh, Ukraine and the support for Ukraine. But what I think about Russia is we should at least have the intellectual exercise to have a conversation with the Russian people that leaving Ukrainian territory is not the end of Russia. Because what we have seen yesterday in the stadium and the day before in Putin's speech was trying to connect uh, uh, the, the uh, loss in this war of aggression with the end of Russia. And, and I think at least there we should have a conversation. There is a future for Russia after Russia has left uh, Ukrainian territory. That's a big question. Who are these people you have to have the conversation yes, with? Uh, yes, it's yeah. best decided by the Russian people, but... Uh, okay. yeah. Great, thank you. So, uh, First of all, I think it takes long, very long time. Because I think basically Russia will be free when you will have two memorials in the Red Square, a memorial for the victims of Stalinism and a memorial for the victims of Putinism. And when you will have a president of Russia uttering the kind of speech that Richard von Weizsäcker uh, pronounced on May 8, 1985, 40 years after the end of World War II. And we have to manage Russia carefully uh, to speak with the elites, to try to push the civil society, to continue the sanctions, certainly not only before when Putin will leave, but as long as Russia will have this kind of nationalistic and imperial ambitions. And for the Russian people, we will have certainly not to repeat the mistakes that we did after 1991 which was basically to have a kind of Keynesian policy for the rich and a kind of policy inspired by Milton Friedman for the poor. So we will have certainly to create the conditions for Russia to disarm and in exchange to have more prosperity. But first of all, it's not the priority. The priority is Ukraine. Thank you. So disarm and change. These are like good takes away and for the future. In the yeah. long run. And uh, mid your answer. Would you like to answer this or would you like to just, we can move on if you have no I question. Agree that sanctions shouldn't be abandoned or lifted, at least uh, regarding specific sectors, uh, technologies, uh, everything related to military industry, even if Putin is gone, exactly because Russia is an aggressor waging the largest war since 1945 cannot receive the plan uh, and the capacity to, you know, uh, strengthen its army once more again to, to have a revenge. The second problem, why there are no, um, um, the, the second point here, why uh, there is no strategy is simply a fear. Honestly, I don't have, after one year of uh, similar discussions, I don't have another, uh, another type of answer why Western countries are most probably uh, not ready to discuss uh, the future scenarios for Russia. Exactly this is fear what to do if Russia is starting disintegrating. And from this point of view, I disagree that we have to divide between Ukrainian victory on the one hand and what happens to Russia on the other. Exactly because as a Ukrainian expert working with Russian aggression for many years, I see the risk that the decisive moment when it will become clear what would be what will be the consequences of defeat on the ground in Ukraine for Russian state generally. The support to Ukraine, which is coming from Western countries, will be either significantly decreased or even stopped, exactly to prevent dissolution of Russia or any kind of other negative consequences. And last but not least, about whom to talk, I think that this is a real pro problem right now, exactly because people who pretend to be it's, uh, let's say the alternative voice, alternative to Putin, they are, you know, um, presenting themselves as Russian opposition. They have no capacities to, to capture the power after Putin at all. And that's the problem. So the hopes for automatic exchange of Russian aggressive policy towards liberal democracy once Putin is gone are not, you know, founded well. You. So would you like to to that? No, thank you. And the last final question I see over there, really coming out of that. 
Yeah, I cannot resist Goran's question as well. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Mattia, please over there. Yes. Hi, Mattia Nellis. I'm a foreign policy advisor for an MP uh, here in the Bundestag. I wanted to ask again about the EU. Much has been said, but I wanted to ask Mr. Tenser, assuming Ukraine fulfills the seven conditionalities and the um, accession talks are open, how would you assess the French willingness to actually throw its weight behind this accession process? Because from the outside, it seemed to me it was more a gesture of solidarity the candidate status from the Ukraine, um, to Ukraine, but how really is Macron willing to throw political capital in, uh, into supporting Ukraine's EU accession, given the skepticism he has voiced about the EU accession process? So can we chew gum and walk at the same time, reform the accession process while letting Ukraine in speedily? Thank you. So, well, well basically, yeah. Well, um, I, I, I didn't capture, I mean, because of the sound, not everything you said, sorry, uh, but uh, basically... Will France throw its weight behind Ukraine's bid for the EU accession? No, I, I think basically Macron will continue to support, I mean, uh, Ukraine's accession. I think there is no doubt about that. There is a lot of doubt about, you know, Macron long-term Russian policy, certainly. Uh, there are some doubt about, you know, what he considers if it's only, for instance, he's just giving lip service, for instance, to Zelensky plans. We have questions about that. But about the support to Ukraine succession, absolutely there is no doubt. Thank you. So, and final, final question goes to Goran over there. And, uh, and we then what's passed to our final round. Yeah, Goran you talked a lot about guns, you talked a lot about politics, but very little about money, except what money Ukraine should receive. But my question is, because we follow the money quite a lot in this foundation, what can be done about the money inside the European Union? Let me be more specific. At this moment, the trade with Russia is only one third of what Germany trades with Poland. Not my data, but the German Business Association, the freshest data. But also Germany trades quite a lot with countries like Hungary, for example, that has been actually troubling and makes money. What is the strategy of EU not only having a political approach, but let's say a money and economic approach in its way how its economy will follow the guns and the politics? Great question to link to the next one about what needs to be done as soon as possible. I mean, would you like to take this question? I don't want to repeat what did you just said on a non-private investment which is needed in Ukraine and that there are preconditions for that, especially question of security. Second, uh, we are seeing that there are third countries bypassing sanctions uh, and on companies also. And uh, this is why the, our, our Minister for Economy, Robert Habeck, I think yesterday, uh, brought up a proposal to, to, to go after that uh, by, by, by law and by implementation of, of law. Uh, Germany, it's, 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 uh, I, it, I didn't see a lot of other countries uh, talking about that for the, recently, but I think if Germany picked that up and bring it to, to, to Brussels, we could, go, uh, we could have a very quick proxy, progress on that. Yeah. I wish we had a lot more time to follow up on these questions and uh, really need to uh, summarize now and come to the close. And as a closing question, I uh, mentioned at the beginning that we will talk about this. And this is about one thing that you think, you, well, Europe, Germany, France, need to do or to do more in 2023 to advance Ukraine's victory. And really like in one sentence, two sentences, one thing. Uh, who would like to first first? Ah, shall we start with Nico then? One thing think, by I the end of 2023. I would include the US into the list of countries that you just mentioned. And uh, for me, it's very simple. I think we as the partners of Ukraine, we have the power to shorten this war by giving Ukraine what, it's need, what it needs, and we should stop deterring ourselves from doing it. Thank you. Yes. Yes. If I save some time and I can can, can mis mis mistake it for another issue. I just want to come back to that, what Irina said at the beginning. Uh, as an MP, I just want to, want to express my, me, my, my, my shame for the fact that I'm, I'm very happy that we recognized Holodon War last year. But um, it, it's, it's shameful that it took years and years of work. It was tough, a tough job to do, and we, we get there, but I think the, the, the victims and, and, and the Ukrainian people deserve better and faster. Sorry for that. Thank you. Uh, one thing by the end of the year. 
300 more tanks in addition to those 150 which were already promised, Kamikaze drones, longer range missiles and decision on fighter jets. Because fighter jets, as we suppose, will be rather a part of, from, from the military logic on the ground, rather part of air defense. Uh, air defense of Ukraine for longer period rather than specific outside of the military outside of the military things is there anything you need Begin the beginning of discussion on uh, international persecution of Russia in international criminal court and other international institutions tribunals thank you Nicholas yours two things first of all it was already said let's stop de-escalating second thing is speak more and more each day and every day i mean that's the duty of the leaders of the free world about the crimes and save human lives that must be our main concern to save ukrainian lives which is certainly more weapons all the weapons and if all weapons are not enough let's take action Thank you. It's been a tremendously rich panel and thank you so much for raising all these questions. Really, save lives, act fast, don't fear and deliver. I think these are my key takeaways. Thank you so much, my dear panelists. Thank you so much, the participants. And I am passing on to Daniela now to uh, summarize. Thank you, Ina, for steering us through a very intense debate of almost one and a half hours and for lending us on time. I think if something be became clear in the discussion, and I thank you all for your contributions, is uh, first of all a very clear to-do list. And we started in a very broad way and said victory needs to be, victory for Ukraine needs to be defined in a very broad sense. Um, and yet at the end, where you all landed was in the area of right now winning the war. Um, and the calls you issued were, were very clear. But I think throughout uh, the discussion, other topics had prominence, and rightly so, and that is bringing justice to Ukraine, uh, being aware of the huge power that lies within civil society um, and the way we need to listen. And I know that, Ina, your work and Sasha's work with IRF is precisely that, supporting, also listening, bringing those perspectives to the work we do here in Berlin, in Brussels, in Washington, in other places, and most lately at the Munich Security Conference. Um, and also, you know, the degree of frankness and honesty that we heard today, basically say it as it is, have a very clear and blunt and sober perspective on what Russia pr represents in all its dimensions, a lot came out in the statements on the panel, have a very clear eyed view on what Ukraine is, um, a country that is not only fighting for its existence, but where people, while there's a war, are fighting for progress in their own societies, the issue of fighting corruption came up, this never stopped, and we have to keep that in mind. And then the enormous task for Europe, for the Americans, uh, for us here in Germany, to think through how we can be ready to support Ukraine once the phase of reconstruction um, and recovery is there. So I thank you all for having joined us. Thank you all for your contributions. Um, and please stay tuned in. We will continue this conversation in all shapes and forms. And I thank you all for being here, and in particular, our panel. So I invite you uh, to join me in a round of applause to all five of you. Thank you. Thank you.